one of the areas that I do research in, but I will be actually doing research right now in three areas. So the, uh, one of the areas that I'm very involved in has to do with mobile health, and this is in India, working with patients with diabetes. And um, we're doing a large study to look at how text messaging can help increase adherence in diabetes patients and also can increase uh, prevention in their families. So that's my one area. Uh, in addition, uh, for those of you who know about Google Glass, uh, Google had a contest and I submitted a tweet about improving public health through the use of Google Glass um, about evidence-based medicine. It was a lot to fit into uh, 140 characters, but I did win a pair of Google Glass, which I'll be getting next week. So hopefully that will be a fruitful line of research as well. And then the third area that I do research in is the area that I'll be talking about today. And um, what I'd like to start by talking about is blogs in general and that um, there's an estimate that 19 million people write blogs. It's very hard to calculate the actual number. Also, it's easy to define what a blog is, but when you do a count of blogs, how do you decide um, if somebody starts a blog and they write one post? Is this part of the 19 million people who write blogs or is it actually 18 million 999,000 and so on. So it's a little bit hard to calculate this. Uh, it's a technology that seems to stay on an upward curve with uh, even with the recent purchase of Tumblr. Uh, blogging is, is something that is pretty much across all ages, uh, ethnicities, economic levels, and, and so on. Uh, so if I could see you, I would ask, does anybody here read blogs? So maybe, um, uh, uh, Vesna, is it possible to ask? Thank you. Half of maybe 50% of the people here raise their hands. That they read blogs. Uh, yes. That they read the blogs. Yeah. And yes. how, how many people write blogs? And how, how many people write blogs? How many people write blogs? One. <laughs> One. <laughs> One. <laughs> One. <laughs> OK. Uh, so as as you can see from the image here, I wrote uh, a blog. So as, as you can see from the image here, I wrote a blog. Um, I don't write very often, but I um, I don't write very often, but I've been doing it for quite a few years. Um, I hear an echo now. Um, I hear an echo now. Okay. Oh, it stopped. Thank you. Okay, so um, I write a blog, and uh, I, it's a health blog in the sense that I write about health issues, but it isn't a blog about my health. It's just a blog about health topics. And, but there are many people who write about their personal experiences with health. And um, I'll start by saying that there are very public ways that people do this, like people write a book and they talk about their experiences as a cancer patient or as the caregiver to a child with a rare disease. And then there have always been very private ways that people, people write letters to their friends, people write a journal, and they use this as a way of talking about their experience of health. And if you look at some of the, um, if you look at this in more detail, uh, one of the categories that we can look at is which of these are technology enabled 
and which of these aren't. So obviously, if you write a book, even though you probably use your computer to write the book, it's not really, it's a physical thing. It's not technology. But certainly one of the things that's happened is that social media has become a very common way that people through um, Twitter and Facebook and so on are communicating with other people about their experience of illness. And one of the ways that has emerged is that of blogs. So blogs are different than these other forms of communication, and in particular, the very commonly used online health communities and the various forms of social media. And one of the differences is that in these, you're typically having a short burst of communication, and also it's not something that's continuous. You're writing about a particular topic, a particular question, in response to something someone else said. While with a blog, you're essentially creating a micro-community around yourself and your illness. And because of the nature of blogging, uh, while it's dated and it's tagged, uh, the format is really unconstrained by things like length, categories, topics. And in fact, that's a really important point because many people who are ill, um, somebody might have a particular illness, but then this might there might be other illnesses as well, or there might be, say, some mental health issues associated with this particular illness. Um, another thing that blogs allow is for people to easily incorporate uh, images, video, and so on to supplement their blog. And I'll give some examples of this. So the problem statement that I started this research with is that there's a lack of research on this phenomenon of patients uh, writing blogs. And just to, to, to try to understand a little bit about why people are doing this, how people are doing this, and what the broader implications of this are. Um, so one question to start with, of course, is how many patient bloggers? Um, so in your room, you said there's one person who blogs, and I didn't ask if this person writes a blog about um, uh, health or just writes a blog in general. But it's very hard, just like it's hard to know how many blogs there are and how many people who write blogs, it's also very hard to know how many patient bloggers there are. So um, this is just information in the U.S. that 13% of e-patients, which are people who use the Internet for Health Information, write a blog about their diagnosis and treatment. And this is information that comes from Pew Internet and American Life. And um, another study, HINTS, which is done by the National Institutes of Health, the NIH in the U.S., found that of the 69% of people with Internet access, 7% reported writing a blog. Um, but given the number of people with chronic disease, there is a lot of possibility for people to be writing blogs who aren't currently. And one of the things that's particularly interesting when you think about this as a mechanism for communicating about health and illness is that there are many assistive technologies that are available so that if somebody's illness makes it difficult for them to sit at their computer and type, uh, they can use voice and there, there are other technologies. So illness doesn't become um, an inhibitor to the creation of a blog. Uh, so another question to ask is how many health blogs are there? And this is from Technorati that uh, worldwide there's about 24,000 health or health-related blogs, but this includes, say, blogs like mine, where I'm not writing about my personal health, but I'm just writing about health issues. So it's very hard to separate those out. Certainly the largest number of patient blogs are about the variety of types of cancer, and in particular, women with 
um, breast cancer or who have survived breast cancer are very active bloggers and also uh, very active with social media in general. But even in defining how many blogs there are, it would be very, very difficult to do an accurate count because you would have very, I mean, they're very obvious blogs, and I'll show some, but there are ones that where people talk about cancer, but they're also talking about many completely unrelated things to health. And I'll give an example of this. Um, uh, recently, Roger Ebert died, and uh, Roger Ebert was very famous in the United States for a show on TV called Siskel and Ebert, and he was a movie reviewer and very famous for that. Uh, he wrote a blog and uh, mostly wrote about movies and things related to movies, but also he wrote about his personal health issues. Do you call that a patient blog or not? I would say no, because less than 50% is actually about patient blogging. Uh, the initial interest that I had in patient blogging was through a friend of mine who was um, a psychology professor, and I knew him quite well because we had been going to the same conference since we were both graduate students. And um, I was supervising some of his graduate students, and, um, and that's when he became ill. And uh, he started this blog, and the blog was, um, was something that he used to a large extent as for the, the personal uh, opportunity to just reflect on his illness, to write about how he was feeling, but it was also a way to share what he was feeling with his family, uh, with his colleagues, and with his students. So this way, people didn't have to always say, oh, did you see the doctor lately? What's the latest CAT scan? How are you feeling? And so on. Their blog was a source of information for many of these people. Um, so he shared his blog with me because I was working with his students and therefore um, was actually very much impacted by his illness um, in his role, but also as a friend, I was very concerned about him. So it was an opportunity to, um, to stay current in his medication, his status, and so on. And it was a really, in some ways, fascinating window into the course of his disease. And as you can see, he used imagery in his blog. Um, the um, uh, header for his blog uh, said, and um, I'll just read it quickly, this is a sort of stream of consciousness related to my recent brain incidents. I apologize for the lack of editing. Although I have no major cognitive impairments, there is still some slight motor lag with my left hand, resulting in too many typos and missing letters. And in a way, it was, it was kind of a sad statement for somebody who was a well-published um, and well-loved professor, and I think very, very vivid. Um, blogs like Gary's are probably the most common type of patient blog that an, indivi an individual with a diagnosis decides to write about it. It's not something that's widely read. Uh, there were very few comments on Gary's blog posts, and it was also really hard to find. If Gary hadn't told you about it, the likelihood that you would stumble upon it is very, very slim. There are a couple of blogs that have been very widely read, and the two most popular ones, um, one was from NPR, which uh, is National Public Radio in the United States and is extremely popular here. And one of the um, uh, well-known um, journalists at NPR, uh, Leroy Sievers, 
developed cancer and wrote about his cancer. Uh, he had a blog that was called My Cancer, and after he died, his widow continued the blog for some time. Uh, and then NPR had the idea that they would they wanted to somehow keep this notion going. His blog, uh, he was posting quite regularly. His uh, posts would have hundreds of comments in response to them. And the comments were messages of love, of, um, uh, of concern for his illness. And also, people would write with advice and suggestions about what he should try doing. Uh, furthermore, people would use it as an opportunity to tell their own story uh, about themselves or about a loved one who was also ill. And some of the comments were quite short, but many of them were extremely long. When NPR uh, started this blog called Our Cancer, it was a group blog. And um, I, I think it was five or six people who were writing about their cancer. Uh, they were writing pretty sporadically, as opposed to very committed to it the way Leroy had been. And it had very few readers, very few comments, and pretty much um, fizzled out over time. So it was interesting to see that as an experiment. Um, the other blog that I would say was extremely popular, besides Leroy Seavers, was Dana Jennings, the person who is on the right here. And Dana is uh, a New York Times uh, journalist. And he does not write about health, but he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and he was um, he was finding himself uh, just having incredible difficulty writing, doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was supposed to be working on a, a book at the time, and he was just totally focused on his illness. So he approached one of the health writers at the New York Times. And he asked if he could write about his cancer instead, um, in addition to his other responsibilities. So he wrote a blog that was in the um, uh, Tuesday Science section of the New York Times in print. But it was also online. And um, he wrote very eloquently. Unlike uh, somebody like Gary, the first blog I showed, uh, Dana had a editor, so um, I asked him, actually, he said that his blog posts were very lightly edited, but still, he didn't have typos and spelling mistakes and grammatical errors because this was, this was given a little bit more of a professional uh, perspective. And his blog posts, he didn't know the exact number of readers, but it was in the hundreds of thousands. And this, um, I, I just showed the top part. He had um, many, many comments. So this one post had 700 comments. He, again, like Leroy, had messages of love and support. He had advice and suggestions about what to do or what to try. Uh, but also he had, uh, like you can see in the top line here, I just lost my 13-year-old. Um, People were using it as an opportunity to tell their own story. Um, these, the two blogs that I just showed were certainly two of the most widely read, heavily um, promoted ones because they were associated with a news outlet. But I started to see more and more examples of blogs that were also promoted. And this one in particular was from Baptist Health South Florida. And this was a woman who was being treated at the hospital for breast cancer. Um, she wrote a blog about this. And it was promoted on, um, on the home page of the hospital website. Uh, she wrote very eloquently. And like the other ones, extremely personal details about what was going on as she was being treated. 
one of the differences between her blog and the last two I showed is that she had very, very few comments. And actually, the comment that I show here was a comment from her mother. Uh, but most of the posts that I looked at had very, very few comments listed. Uh, this is from the Prostate Cancer Foundation. And their president of communications uh, himself developed prost can prostate cancer, um, rather, um, I guess, an irony in a sense. But as um, somebody who worked for this foundation, as somebody who, whose specialty was communications, he decided to write a blog about his prostate cancer. And what was interesting in this case is that you could see in the initial post that there were quite a few comments, and most of these were from his colleagues, not from outside people. There's a couple examples that I've been able to find of other um, group blogs or blogs that were promoted as part of something else. So uh, Everyday Health, which is um, sort of like WebMD, or it's a health destination with lots of information about lots of things. Uh, they had a group blog, and people, uh, and anybody who wanted to could start a blog here. But most of the blogs were ones, if somebody started one, they posted one time and then didn't continue it. But they had a small group of people who were regularly blogging. Most of them were also blogging at another site, so it was cross-posted. Uh, but I've been able to see some um, other examples of this. In general, the group blogs have not been particularly successful. It's the individual ones that seem to be. And once you start to be aware of blogging, you find examples every place. So um, for instance, in Twitter, you would see in people's profiles that people write blogs. And what's fascinating uh, when you start to click on these links is that it feels like, um, like Alice in Wonderland, that you're going down the rabbit hole because you find a blog, but many bloggers link to other bloggers. And all of a sudden, you're in this whole world of blogs related to a particular disease. So recently in Twitter, um, somebody followed me who uh, had psoriasis and mentioned this in his profile. But then also there was a link to something that was obviously a blog. And I went and I looked, and he wrote about his psoriasis and also about many of the compounding issues, such as depression. And then he had a blog roll on the side. And uh, most of these were also psoriasis bloggers. And I started linking on them. And um, uh, people had video. People had images. People had very, very eloquent uh, portrayals of their life with psoriasis. So uh, as I was interested in patient blogging, and not seeing that there had been a body of research done on this. Um, I conducted a preliminary study, and this was with um, a student of mine who is an RN, a nurse. And uh, we just sent this out to some people that we knew who blogged. Um, we also posted this on Twitter. And we very quickly had 24 respondents to this. And um, what was fascinating is that in asking people why they wrote a blog, the most common theme that we discovered is that people were using this as an opportunity to help others with the same diagnosis. Uh, because this was a very loosely done survey, it was particularly interesting to see that People, people were responding to very open-ended questions. And we were able to learn things like um, from a woman with breast cancer. She said that when she writes in her blog, it gives her an opportunity to reflect, 
to express her feelings, but it also gave her this opportunity to communicate with family and friends, and then they could think about it, and they could choose then whether they were going to call her or email her or write a comment. And she found this much, much more helpful than when she ran into people uh, because she would see friends and she could see that in people's heads they're struggling with, do I ask how she is? Do I say nothing? Uh, and if there was a discussion about her latest doctor's visit, that she often found that she had to console them instead of them consoling her. And then there was that additional emotional burden. So by writing in her blog, it was just about her, and she was able to express her thoughts. And then people had this detachment where they could read it, they could process it, and then they could choose if they were going to correspond back to her. So in the analysis of the preliminary study, there were clearly benefits indicated, and these benefits were to a variety of people. So it wasn't just to the individual patient or caregiver, um, because certainly there, we, we were discovering that there were a lot of blogs that were written by somebody who was the caregiver to somebody with a devastating illness, and we did count those as patient blogs. But we also found that family and friends were benefiting, that people in similar situations who were able to read these blogs, to learn from them, and to also feel that support that you get from somebody who is in a similar situation. Um, what we weren't seeing very much of, but we're speculating that there could be some significant benefits to, would be to clinicians who are treating people with these diseases and also to medical researchers because there was so much rich information in the narratives that patients created. So our hypothesis was that communicating the experience of illness through blogging provides positive psychosocial benefits to patients with chronic illness. And um, because the student that I was working with was a nurse, she was using a theoretical model uh, health as an expanding consciousness. And so that's looking at the evolving interaction between the individual and the individual's environment. And um, so uh, we did a literature search, and there was very, very little literature. There has been, this was done in 2009, um, uh, or we started the research in 2009. This was uh, completed in uh, 2011, two years ago. And um, so we were, we were surprised how little information there was about patient blogging. And so we designed uh, a survey. We worked with our IRB to get approval. Um, one of the things that may have been problematic with the IRB is that we had this very long consent form that people had to sign, and I think that that was a deterrent. We had a... Um, and then there, there was also um, an issue with uh, that we were providing an incentive, um, so gift cards to a small number of uh, people selected from this pool of respondents, and um, and we discovered that uh, there were a number of people who ended up consenting, not filling out the survey but then entering an email address in the drawing. So that was a little bit of a problem in terms of the response. Uh, we were fortunate enough that uh, somebody who wrote for the Boston Globe uh, learned about our study and wrote about it. So this was in the print version and the online version. And I think that that dramatically helped to spread the word about this. Uh, the survey that we created was 34 questions, and we had a mix of um, open-ended essay questions, 
because we really wanted to understand the motivational and psychosocial factors related to blogging. But then there were also demographic questions and then very specific yes, no, or multiple choice questions that we asked. Um, and some of these were, what is the diagnosis or the illness that prompted you to begin a blog? Uh, has writing a blog made a difference? So obviously it's um, your self-perception. Uh, has it changed your sense of connection? And then one of the questions that we were really interested in is if people had shared their blog with their clinician. Uh, so the results, we found that there was a high level of comorbidities, and uh, we were also interested to see in the demographics, it was primarily female, um, primarily Caucasian, primarily college educa uh, education or graduate or professional education, and um, almost everybody was between the ages of 25 and 55. Uh, so one, one of the things that we were very interested in is the public nature of these blogs. Uh, we found that um, almost all of these were, in fact, things that were, in theory, uh, things that you could search for in a search engine. Most people used their own name. Uh, most of them shared their blog with their friends and family members. Most of them, almost all of them, read other people's blogs. Uh, many of them had contributed comments to other people's blogs. And uh, the, most of them were using other forms of social media as well. So we asked, um, is your blog public? And again, it's most of them. Uh, do you blog under your own name, under a pen name or pseudonym or anonymously? And, and that was particularly interesting because there is a stigma associated with many diseases and something that people may not want to be public about, although social media is very much changing that. Um, most of them read other people's blogs. We asked if you shared your blog, and most of them do. It's not just something they write for themselves. But then most of them don't share it with their healthcare providers. And even though we asked... Um, uh, People said that they, even though their blog is public, they would assume that their healthcare provider is too busy or would not be interested in looking for and reading their blog. Um, so uh, this was less than one in four who actually shared their blog, and they felt that, um, and, and certainly they felt that their blog was their reality and not something that they thought that their healthcare provider would find of interest. But also, in many cases, people wanted to vent. And part of what they'd be venting about would be the treatment that they were receiving. Um, and people felt like there could possibly be repercussions if their provider saw what they were saying. So we identified some psychosocial themes such as the increased connectedness that people were feeling with others, especially others in similar situations. And coupled with that is the decreased sense of isolation, the ability to tell one story to others, the increased accountability that they felt to themselves and to others, the increased sense of efficacy, and an increased sense of purpose, meaning, and understanding of illness just through the process of writing about it. Um, so uh, I have a paper that was in JMIR, the Journal of Medical Internet Research, that talks about uh, the study and uh, gives a lot of detail, perhaps excruciating detail, about the results of this survey. Um, there had been um, uh, almost 400 respondents, and even after eliminating the people who basically were only entering the drawing, uh, I, there were 272 respondents, so really quite a large number, although a tip of the iceberg of patient bloggers. So one of the things that became interesting as we were doing this work, while we had an IRB approval to do the survey, 
there were also ethical issues that were coming up as we were increasingly in contact with and reading patient blogs. And one of the ways that we had come in contact with people is that we were um, using a snowball technique to ask people to retweet or repost the link to our survey so that it would spread um, as much as possible. And some of the questions that um, I started to ask is, is there a point that this becomes invasive to blog authors? And does it ever feel, as a researcher, does it ever feel voyeuristic or do you feel like you're stalking people when you start to read these details, especially since in some cases you do a search because, or somebody has links to the other forms of social media they use. And you really learn an enormous amount about not just people's illness, but about their families, about their jobs, many other aspects of their life. Um, when you come across one of these blogs, is it okay to register, to follow the blog, um, to like the blog? Is it okay to comment? Is it okay to follow up if you've got questions and contact somebody when their information is, is given there? And really, um, illness is replete with emotional experiences. And as a researcher, you sometimes become very involved in these. And um, it's, it's sometimes really hard to know when you read these devastating accounts of people's illness, is it okay to cry, to feel horrible for them, or in some cases that you count your blessings and you feel like there but for the grace of God go I. Um, when somebody becomes more ill, uh, when somebody is dying or when somebody dies, what do you do? And it's, it, it's a really interesting struggle as a researcher. Um, I, with Gary Klatsky, I had been in touch with his sister, who for a short time continued his blog. And I know that, um, and I asked her, is it okay with you if I talk about Gary and his blog? Are you comfortable with that? And um, she was actually really quite pleased because she felt like this was related to Gary's work and she felt that this would actually be a real benefit. And one of the things that I was very happy to do in this JMIR paper is to have this acknowledgement where we were thanking Gary um, as the source of inspiration. But as we continued this work, what I discovered is um, that more and more questions were arising, like uh, chopping the head of the hydra, and then more heads grow. And um, so certainly I was interested in doing a further investigation of the emotional outcomes, but also about the physical health outcomes. And I was starting to wonder what kind of study could be done. And is there any way of doing a controlled study to really understand the impact of this on the course of someone's disease? Uh, another question I had is, are there situations where a clinician should recommend a blog to a newly diagnosed patient? Um, are there patients who would benefit from blogging but wouldn't think to do so? Are there differences based on the type of illness? And one of the categories that I thought about is things that are hidden versus things that are visible, such as um, mental illness. And uh, I wondered about this issue of if people were going to, if a clinician was going to recommend that somebody write a blog, is there an optimal time to do so? Like, is it at the point of diagnosis when somebody most needs that outlet and that reflection? Or is it past that point? Um, and what kind of tools would people need to support them in being able to create blogs, just to give them the guidance? Like, here's a couple of blogging sites. This is how you start it. Here's how often you should write, that kind of thing. Um, another question that I ask is, just because of the difficulty that we had in finding bloggers with our survey, I wondered, what about the people who benefit 
from reading patient blogs? And is there a way to help people, say somebody who's newly diagnosed with breast cancer, to find other breast cancer bloggers? And, and then this, this overall question about, through this process of analysis, what can be learned about the experience of illness? So here's a passage from a blog, and this is um, a breast cancer blog. Uh, talk, the, the name of it is Breast Cancer, but Doctor, I Hate Pink, a reference to the ubiquitous um, pink ribbons, pink labels, pink, um, you know, in, in, in support of breast cancer research. And this was a fascinating post because she was just writing about how she had discovered over time that for certain medical procedures that what she wore made a huge difference and made things so much more convenient. And it's a really interesting example because when would a clinician or a patient educator say to somebody, um, here's your appointment, this is the treatment that you're having, here's a recommendation of what to wear. It's the kind of information that you can so much more easily learn from other people than that you can learn in any um, professional clinical setting. So where all of this has led to is, um, is the research that I'm currently doing, which is on creating a repository of patient blogs. And my initial thought was that you could create a repository and you could just ask people to list blogs in it in much the same way that people currently have blog roles on the um, side of their blogs. But then one of the things that became apparent is that there are good tools to basically scour the web and look for and identify patient blogs. And that raises an interesting ethical issue of is it, these are searchable, you can find them, but is it a violation of somebody's privacy for you to list these in a repository? And um, so that's not a solved question yet, but um, what I've also been investigating is if somebody came to a repository um, for instance, a person newly diagnosed with breast cancer, what kinds of, what are the characteristics of a blog that someone would want to read and what makes a good match uh, and what kind of specialized search engine do you want to have to prompt people? So I've been looking quite broadly at examples of specialized search engines that seem to be successful and one example is with dating sites where you have a lot of criteria that you can specify, but perhaps only certain things are really important. Um, so maybe you don't care about income level, but you care if somebody is or isn't a smoker, or maybe you care about age range, or maybe you care if somebody does or doesn't have children. And so similarly with this, if you, my example of um, a woman newly diagnosed with breast cancer, is she interested in people who live in the same region of the world? Is she interested in people the same age range? Um, is she interested in uh, somebody's family situation? What makes a good match? And that's something where I need to be developing a hypothesis and, uh, and then testing this. And once you have a repository of patient blogs, one of the opportunities that it opens is that of being able to learn from blogs. And so um, what I've been looking at it is from three perspectives, that of patients, clinicians, and researchers. And so in particular, if you have blogs amassed in this way, um, what kinds of things can you do with the individual blogs and to provide textual summaries or even visual representations? But also, and perhaps more importantly, 
what kinds of questions can you answer in terms of people's reactions to diagnoses, um, the coping strategies people develop, such as the example that I just showed of this woman who basically perfected what was the right thing to wear when she was going for her treatment. Um, there's been a lot of effort to create sites where people can report on or track their reactions to medication. But when you read through blogs, you learn an enormous amount about people's side effects, about the approaches to complementary and alternative treatment that people are taking, how they're using um, uh, herbal supplements, med uh, meditation, yoga, and so on. And just understanding these treatments, people's, uh, the issue around adherence, and the many, many aspects of life uh, as a cancer patient. And so with a um, repository, you can start to answer questions like this and perhaps get very different data than would otherwise be uh, available. So there's certainly a lot of information that's been um, uh, accumulated by looking at other forms of social media. And so doing sentiment analysis, um, uh, Google flu trends, uh, looking for, um, even for weather and natural disasters, um, trying to understand that using social media almost as an early warning system and then understanding how people live with this devastation and what works for people and what doesn't work for people and some of the public health issues that arise. So there's been an enormous amount of effort and an increasing number of technologies that are used to mine this kind of information. I've also been looking at other types of aggregation sites, not necessarily related to health, and trying to understand um, so, for instance, something like Huffington Post, which is a very popular news site, but it basically exists because it has an enormous number of bloggers who are contributing, as opposed to a tra traditional journalistic model. Um, how does something like that work? How does something like the many uh, travel sites uh, or restaurant recommendation sites or things where it's uh, primarily or completely user-generated content and what attracts people to contribute and how do people use it and what are the search mechanisms within those sites. So in doing this work, this ongoing work with patient blogs, I'm trying to learn from non-health examples as well as from health examples to do something that will um, hopefully uh, solve this unmet need to help patients better find blogs that are relevant to them and also to help uh, clinicians and researchers to learn from these rich narratives that people are creating about their experience of illness. And at this point, what I'd like to do is to take questions. <laughs>